Well, welcome to the Cross Border Interviews. Today, we're honored to be sitting down and speaking with Peterborough Councillor Kevin Duguay. Peterborough is a -a one-of-a-kind place located on nature's doorstep. It has many trails and parks right within its city limits and easy access to cottage country and the lakes and beauty that it has to offer. Peterborough offers a balanced lifestyle that includes a growing community of entrepreneurs, a hip downtown, and I can attest to that, and a community calendar filled with many, many great events. So stay tuned, and we'll be right back after a quick message with cross-border interviews featuring Peterborough Councillor Kevin Duguay. Are you passionate about local governance and municipal issues? Do you believe in the power of community-driven conversations? Then join us at the Cross-Border Network, where we bring together voices from across Canada to shine a spotlight on the challenges and the triumphs of our municipalities. But we need your support to keep the conversation going. Visit crossborderinterviews.ca today to show your support by backing the show monthly or making a one-time annual donation. Your contribution will help us grow and expand our reach, bringing important stories to even more listeners across the nation. Together, we can make a difference. Together, we can amplify the voices of local communities. Together, we can shape a brighter future for all. Cross Border Network where local matters and your support counts. Visit us today at crossborderinterviews.ca. Councillor, I want to thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. It's always a pleasure to go back to my old stomping grounds of Country 105 uh, Peterborough and talk to municipal leaders in my old... Oh, I just feel... It's so weird to talk to someone from Peterborough, but I'm so happy that you took time out of your busy schedule to do this. So, Kevin, I want to start with a simple question, but it's an overarching one for this first segment of the show. And that is, where did your sense of duty to serve your community come from? Well, thanks, Chris. Um, From a number of, perhaps, uh, there's two parts. One, my entire uh, professional life, I have worked in a senior capacity for um, four different municipalities. And more recently, I've had my own uh, private planning consulting business. So I worked, I've either worked directly for or with municipalities across Ontario and even abroad in uh, Jamaica. So I've always had that particular interest in, you know, municipal local government, but I'm, I will reflect upon a time in my misspent uh, adolescence. Uh, my, my mother and father um, led uh, a, what would it be called, what was called then a local improvement initiative on a street that we resided on in Riverside, former village annexed by the city of Windsor, 1966. The street was uh, substandard, didn't have full sidewalks, didn't have curbs, didn't have gutters, a lot of families, a lot of kids. So my mother and father decided that sidewalks, curb, gutter, and a properly paved road was important. They led the process. And I was impressed by what the work they had to undertake. And it wasn't simple, it wasn't easy. They were subject to some criticism. But at the end of the day, the road was completed, the sidewalks were installed. And that has that left a, a very favorable impression upon me. And I, I'm remiss, there was actually a third moment where um, in my vol- I was doing some volunteer work when I was younger in Windsor. And I had a chance to meet one of the mayors of the city of Windsor at, at the time. I think it was Frank Wansborough, if I remember correctly. And it just left me with a really, I, I, was, very, I was impressed. And um, so those, those three things, professional life, uh, you know, a, a moment within my family and having meeting uh, and an impressionable moment with the mayor. Uh, I was a young teenager at the time. Combined, I think, has um, spurred an interest to consider serving as a councillor in my city. So what was happening in 2022? Because from my records, this is the first time you've put your name on the ballot to run in the municipal election. And you put it in for uh, uh, the ward of autonomy, which is part of the city of Peterborough. What was going on at that time that you finally said, okay, Kevin, it's time to rip the Band-Aid off and put my name on the ballot. Was there an issue going on or was it just the right time in your personal life and business life that it sort of everything meshed together? Well, Chris, um, a number of uh, factors led to my decision to, 
um, seek municipal election. One, it, uh, there were circumstances that were impacting my city uh, that um, there, there were challenges and opportunities. Peterborough is a city that is clearly poised for considerable growth and development. That has been predetermined by various, you know, by provincial planning legislation, by a, a number of factors. So that's that would have been one matter. Secondly, I had repeated uh, requests made by business leaders, fellow Rotarians, others in my community, please consider serving on council. And they identified that I had a particular skill set that would be of value to potentially value to our city. Um, the 20, uh, the previous council uh, term, it was a very difficult time for all city councils. Nobody set, nobody set out in 2018 to serve on council, su suggesting that because of a pandemic event, they would shut down their cities. A very difficult moment for all councils. So uh, I, saw, I saw and identified professionally and personally a need. I was encouraged by many residents, business leaders, and others, uh, and I. It was it was those factors. It was time, and I identified that, and recognized that perhaps my council would benefit from a professional having a skill set like mine at that decision making table for this electoral term. Now, you you have now been on both sides of that council table. Be as someone who's worked in municipal uh, administration, you know that you present to councils, and I, I've done that in my past. You've had to present to councils, and now you're getting presented to, and you're taking the information that administration is giving you, and you're taking the information that residents are giving you as well. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, you have to make the tough decisions. You have to be that vote on that council. You're one vote on the entire council who has to make the decisions that are in the best interest of the entire community. For you, is there a process that you put each individual issue through to come up with that solution or that vote that you have to make around that council table? Well, thanks, Chris. Um, so the answer is, the answer is um, uh, as follows. For, firstly, I have a genuine respect and trust level with our the staff whose responsibility is to provide expert knowledge based information and recommendations to council. All right. So thus. Uh, that's the first part that I I I, uh, I I acknowledge that those reports are are jet, are well researched. They are they have to be objective. They can't be biased, and they are intended to give me and my other ten council elected officials uh, impartial professional advice. So I I start off with that. Secondly, I do my homework. I research. I, and it's not just planning and development. I was also a parks and recreation director. So I have two very distinct planning or uh, professional backgrounds. I will do my homework. I visit properties. I will speak to staff. Um, I will read as, as, as much background as made available to me um, as possible. And I appreciate council, typical of councils. We don't often receive that staff report, to, say for example, a, a Wednesday evening, Thursday morning, and it is being produced for our formal consideration on Monday. So often we have some heavy lifting to do uh, uh, prior to a meeting. So respect the, the staff report, the work that's gone into it, because I also know the, I also know behind the scenes that any staff recommendation has been vetted by five commissioners, the CAO. It's been it's been screened. It's been you know reviewed to ensure it's appropriate and is defendable. So in turn, what I will do is take that and then research to the extent I can and also follow up with, with uh, staff. Uh, there may be moments where um, we're in a position where you can reach out to a development proponent, a social agency, if you have questions, you can meet with them, you can visit the property. So, you know, it, is that's it the approach. So taking out from the administration perspective, how important is it for yourself to also talk to the residents of your community on issues that are presented in front of you? Because 
you're elected by them. So I'm assuming they've put their trust into your values, your morals of what they want to see the city do over the four years that you're, you've given the opportunity to serve them, but you have to still connect with them and reach out to them and touch base to ensure that they're getting their voices heard around that council table. How important is it for yourself to speak to residents throughout that process of trying to come up with those tough decisions? Oh, Chris, um, absolutely. So the community ratepayers public form one of the factors that must be considered when we're arriving at any decision. Uh, in fact, some of our decision making process, as you know, the statutory planning process, you know, requires their meaningful and direct input. So um, not only it's not just limited to delegates that appear at our council meetings, um, but it also means um, email returning phone calls, emailing, meeting with residents, visiting properties, um, attending uh, public open houses, for example, on budget matters, park redevelopment matters, all of that so that. Um, it, I guess it's equivalent to boots on the ground. You know, your ears close to the ground. Listen carefully. Now, I must qualify. There are moments um, as a counselor where a constituency might be a P objecting to a particular development. Um, and uh, we've had, I've had I'm at least there's, uh, there's one example. We had a multiple unit housing project of, uh, accommodating uh, affordable housing in the south end of the city. And at a public open house, there was some concerns expressed. You know, I met with, met with the residents, followed up with staff, followed up with the residents. Some residents may not have wanted the development, but what my job, as I have always considered as a counselor, is to not only consider that voice, but consider the needs and interests of the entire community. I'm a city counselor who happens to represent a ward, but it's a capital C. It's really important. I have to think micro, uh, and macro. So in that case, while some residents said they were concerned about the development on balance, considering in all the staff, the staff report, the background, I was uh, inclined to support the project, acknowledging their concerns, but the project um, and its validity um, uh, in this case um, was more, it was, I won't say it outweighed, but even though some residents may not have enjoyed having an apartment building now in their neighborhood on a major street. It it just made community development and citywide sense to have it proceed. So it, you listen to residents. You try, it, just, it, just because there's a voice of objection or concern from my take, doesn't necessarily always mean that I will necessarily um, support that same voice because there's other factors that must be considered. It brings it back to the old uh, Wrath of Khan. And I say, I quote Spock so much on this show. I don't know why, but the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few or the one, right? Because at the end of the day, you're not elected just to represent the people who've elected you, but you're there to represent the entire community. And sometimes the people may not get what they want, but the entire community will get what they need, right? That's right. So consider it like a pointless painting by George Surratt, where he might have applied one dot of paint, but to create the whole paintings, a lot of dots. So I, I, I tend to, and I think it's important for, and I have many colleagues, elected officials who have this genuine ability to think in that broad canvas. They can think the individual project, the individual decision, but they're always prepared and to, and are the ability to think in, think in that broad canvas perspective. I appreciate that. It, uh, it, um... In the realm of engagement, because you talk about the people who have a, an issue with a controversial building or a permit that's going up in their neighborhood. I remember covering city council way back in the early years of my reporting there, so far that I don't even want to name the date because I feel so old talking about it. But I remember you were probably to... reporting some of the work that I was doing as a city planner. <laughs> I wasn't going to go there, but there you go. Um, I remember going into those council meetings, sitting in the media section and seeing about 10, 15 people on average, and they say average, like there might be three one week or 10 the other week, attending council meetings just to hear what was going on at the council meeting. I would hypothetically guess that you would probably hard press to find people showing up to council meetings if there's not a contentious issue on the agenda. 
That being said, do you get a sense in your community that people are engaged enough to give you informed decisions or informed opinions on the day-to-day -day issues that are going on in your community? Uh, yes, I, I, I'm confident that's occurring. So our, our city good for council Peterborough. meetings, like, <laughs> like good, our city council meetings, like many others, it's all live streamed. Uh, and I have, uh, I, I, I still play the great game of hockey two or three times a week. And, um, on a Monday evening, that'll be a council meeting Tuesday evening. I'll suit up and allow some of my colleagues to chase me around the ice for an hour. Uh, but it's interesting. Many of them have actually um, followed the live stream. So there's a live stream component to our council meetings. Uh, there is some of some of your, some journalists, others from um, Examiner and other local publications attend and are doing live tweeting. So there's sort of live commentary occurring. Uh, we have, as soon as a council meeting is finished, uh, our communications department issues a full summary of meetings. So there's a number of ways that are happening quietly uh, where, and I think effectively, where persons can follow meetings without physically attending um, our, our council meetings. Now, it is at times a bit disconcerting when we, for example, have our budget meetings. And we've had to date, leading to what will be our 2025 budget, we've had a couple of open houses and, and the like. It's possible at our 2025 budget session, we'll have some delegations that were there on behalf of particular organizations. So perhaps the health unit, the police commission, perhaps some arts organizations. But we might have physically, we might only have 10, 15 persons from our community attending. But there are other ways that we are utilizing social media and other platforms to seek input. Our community, from my perspective, like many others, is doing a good job. And But there's always ways to try to find other ways to engage a uh, community. Uh, but I'm satisfied we're doing enough. I'm satisfied that in most instances, the public's generally aware. Some members of our community are aware of what's happening at City Hall, what decisions we're making, right? Now, having said that, unless it's that the micro, I find if less the decision bites you in the bum, it's really close, it's on your street in your neighborhood, you might not, Chris Brown might not be that interested if he lived in the South End and it was a development in the West End, right? You talk about budget and before we turn to the city as a whole and talk about some of the accomplishments and the challenges that the city of Peterborough faces, um, the Budget's a difficult thing when you're an, an when you're elected in a district like yourself. So you're elected uh, in an area called Autonomy, which is a part of the city of uh, Peterborough. But when you make decisions around that council table, you can't put it through the lens of only an Autonomy uh, lens. You have to look at it as a city as a whole, and that means sometimes your part of the city may not get everything that it wants every year, but you have to look at it as the bigger picture. For you, do you have to look at every issue as a Peterborough issue or a local issue first? Well, I, I, I stated it earlier uh, uh, that I'm a city councillor who was elected at a ward basis. Yes. Uh, it's critical. It's critical and it's fundamental to um, city council here and throughout our province and our nation that we make decisions, we have to consider the large canvas, the whole community, correct? Uh, because they all work together, they do form, there is a, a, a synergy, a symbiotic relationship. So you can't make a decision just based upon your ward without considering the rest of the community. And you need always to weigh, um, you need to weigh uh, the context of both. So the reason I asked that question, it goes back to the original conversation about uh, engagement. Do you, do you get a sense that people understand that, that as elected officials, you can't just be advocating for your, be, uh, on the behalf of the people that have elected you or your ward, but you have to advocate on the best behalf of the entire city because they've elected you for a reason, right? They've elected you to 
be the strong voice on city council to bring potential new developments, new businesses, this, that, or the other into their, your area of the community? Or do you get a sense in the community, in your ward district, and I don't know what it's called in Peterborough, I apologize, and I'm thinking it's district, but I could be wrong. But do you get a sense that the people who are in Autonomy, the area that you represent, are okay that you're making decisions best on, uh, on the best of the entire city. And that means that there's going to be a sort of trickle down effect for the people of your, their community. So Chris, um, uh, to help you there, we, it's referenced as wards. It's wards. Right. Okay. I thought so. That's fine. I, I feel weird. Wards. I was like, because every province is different and I've been talking to too many municipal leaders these days. No, com completely understandable. Uh, we have five wards. Yeah. Um, uh, the central area, the north, south, and the east, west, if you would describe them that way. The autonomy ward is essentially from our major commercial thoroughfare, everything south to our, from our river all the way to our city's west boundary, within which we have uh, some of our major employment areas, our community college, high school schools. It's a very diverse uh, ward. Now, so you're with Fleming? A flex, Sir Sanford Fleming College, the main campus, is in the Autonomy Ward. I know exactly where it, I know where it is now. Okay. <laughs> All right. Well, there you go. Geography lesson over. Uh, so to your point, I have not, I have certainly not been made aware of from any constituent or any, in any rate payer business owner of a decision that I made that might have been specific to Autonomy Ward or the opposite you know, specific to the community at large that they may have viewed as being to the detriment or disadvantage oh, of okay. the ward. That, that, is not ha that has not happened uh, to date. Good, good for that. Okay, so with that being said, I want to turn to my next segment. And before I ask this question, as I traditionally do on this show, I'm going to preface this line of questioning with the following. This is a conversation between the councillor and myself. This is not a motion of council, not a direction of council, not even a policy of council. This is the councillor's opinion and his opinion alone. Uh, before we talk about accomplishments, I want to talk about the challenges that the city of Peterborough might be under. In your opinion, councillor, what do you believe is the biggest challenge or challenges facing the city of Peterborough today as of recording this interview? Thanks, Chris. So I'm gonna speak then a little bit about geography and context. City of Peterborough, I believe is one of the very few communities in Canada with a population of over 75,000 persons that's not on a major highway. It's not. 115 is important, but it's not part of the 400 highway series, it's not. So contextually and geographically, we're rather unique. We are a, an urban center, the closest center to the east is Oshawa, the close, or excuse me, uh, is Kingston or Belleville, we call it Kingston, and to the west is Oshawa. We serve, this city serves a very large and diverse regional population. We are an important hole in a large donut. So the, that's a challenge, but an opportunity at the same time. So over time, what has Peterborough, Peterborough has a, a college, the main campus for Sanford Fleming College, Trent University, Regional Health Center, um, all the major sports and entertainment, the major sports, entertainment, event facilities, all of them rest within the city of Peterborough. That's an opportunity. Um, all the major roads lead here. Uh, but the challenge is that we serve a very large regional population and have had, uh, we have a limited and defined geographical boundary. So currently serving that large regional population, a lot of, there's a concentration of opportunity and challenges sit inside our city. So we have a somewhat disproportionate number of homeless persons, homelessness, and, and, and it's associated challenges rest in, in the city. All the services are here and thus almost centrifugally um, persons that require transient housing or are difficult to house end up by default somehow within our community, not faulting those persons whatsoever. That is a challenge. And to the second point, we have a very, we have a limited geographic, we have a boundary, it's defined. And we as a community 
are in absolute need of large swaths of both the city and the county region. We need to create together a large assembly of land suitable for uh, employment purposes. We don't, we just don't have enough land. We don't have 5,000 acres in our city. We have the services and capability. That's the second challenge. And that challenge uh, then has, it plays out in, uh, for example, how our tax structure, tax assessment structure has evolved where we're roughly 80% of our tax sources residential and 20% is from non-residential. Most comparable cities, mid-sized cities, their tax ratio could be sitting 70% residential, 30% industrial or 60, 40. We're in a very unhealthy tax assessment ratio. And that's been a result of how our community has evolved over time. And one way to try to remedy that is to bring in non-residential assessment, major employment, but we don't have any land. So our setting, our tax structure, and then our need for employment lands are uh, challenges. And what it means is that as we're contemplating this budget, our rate payers, which are disproportionately more residential property owners than non-residential, have to burden a greater share of uh, the, 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 the tax, taxes need to operate and administer the city. That's a challenge. So how do you fix that? Because that doesn't seem like an easy solution that you can fix overnight. And I'm not going to, I don't want to sugarcoat it, but it doesn't seem like you can fix it by the next time, this time next year, because development while it is happening, growth while it is happening, it is not happening at the pace that municipalities need to sustain a potential growth that they need to keep up with the pace of inflation and pace of challenges that they currently adhere to. While you talk about three unique situations there, whether it be the regional hub of the, I, I don't want to say North Central because you're not North, but you're Central, the sort of Central Ontario hub, if you will, it, I can imagine it's challenging when you're trying to fix all the problems that Peterborough has, whether it be homelessness, vagrancies, uh, transient populations, when you're trying to grow your community, whether it be through an economic driver, bringing more businesses in to sort of equal out that tax imbalance, it's not going to happen tomorrow. So what does the city of Peterborough have to do in the short term to set itself up for the Peterborough of 2035, the Peterborough of 2050, that these issues won't be talked about. All right, so Chris, um, um, valid question. And I acknowledge that development, because this is my wheelhouse professionally, <laughs> it just, and then for example, a major employment area won't happen quickly, uh, but it is, I still acknowledge that it is necessary. So I'm gonna cite for you some things that this council, in less than two years is undertaken. Here we go. The first thing that was, uh, we've, we, we have uh, introduced a important policy with, and I, I led this uh, policy a motion. Um, our official plan was amended to include a policy that will allow our city to extend services beyond our boundaries to adjacent community or communities for growth development with an emphasis on employment base, providing it's mutually beneficial. So in other words, you're the you're the you're the mayor, or you're the council for Jason Township, and you have some uh, lands or opportunities, but you haven't the services. We could work together and create this necessary these necessary and long awaited employment lands. That's number one. That policy exception has been sorely missing from our planning documents for since I I, st I started with the city as their planner in 1989. That's how long we've needed that policy. That's number one. Now, while I led the motion, it required staff report, community support, uh, and that the the backing of council, and and we that was accomplished. Number two, the city of Peterborough has uh, um, established its first ever strategic plan, and that was done uh, with our CAO and council and senior staff, and with with uh, community and stakeholder agency input. And that has that's informing all of our decisions. And we have one of our themes is Peterborough will become a, like a 
choice, a destination, a city of choice. You want to invest here. You want to live here. You want to play here. You want to work here. So that's, that's number two. Number three, um, we have recently decided that we will assume responsibility for economic development. So economic development was uh, um, overseen by an arm's length board ref known as PCAD, Peterborough Corpus Economic Development. So both the city and county have decided, while we've had that arrangement in play for about 25 years, plus or minus, both, or, both entities have decided that they will assume their own, but yet collaborative responsibility for economic development. The decision on economic development must rest with council. I'm not being critical of PCAD, its staff, its, its board of management, but it's the decision there, the decision uh, and the fate of our community needs to rest with council. So that's, that's another example. We have also, um, the mayor uh, has uh, initiated a uh, housing task force, which their fourth of four meetings will be held this week, actually Thursday. And that task force is advancing some uh, I'm going to describe them as some, some far reaching and very aggressive but necessary recommendations on how we can more, how we can tackle um, housing of all forms in our community uh, in a manner that, in a manner that's respectful of our community, its boundaries, its planning. So that's another initiative that has so strategic plan, economic development, cross border servicing. We've also taken on, for example, doctor recruitment. We decide it's going to rest within our city. These are important undertakings and they all add up to your earlier, but what are we doing? So those are the, some of the things that this council is doing already in less than two years. Do you think it's a good path? Yes, it's a necessary, it absolutely is a necessary a path. And I preface that comment that, um, and I'm going to use economic development as an example. Um, the challenge that economic that PCAD would have had, and again, utmost respect for that organization, but if we if they haven't land to attract developers, they're not in a position necessarily to uh, complete that transaction. They don't have the authority. City, the only it's the city, and for example, the county or township. So thus, it makes sense. So that initiative, I have I have fully uh, uh, supported and um, know that there will be, um, I know there will be results forthcoming. The decision to implement a strategic plan, absolutely. Never had one. The cross-border servicing policy, never had, we do now. The mayor's housing task force, we're not the only community that's having to be, we're being challenged to think outside a box or just how can we together come up with ways that are respectful of process and provincial rules and regulations that can ensure housing of all forms is achieved in a more expedited and meaningful way and sustainable way in our community. These are all important, uh, but necessary steps. So do I support them? Absolutely. That's awesome. Before we turn to my last segment, I wanna flip the original question on the Ted a little bit here. We all have challenges. All municipalities have their unique fair shares of challenges, but you as a counselor, you probably are proud about something that goes on in your community from a governmental perspective, from an administration perspective, what's the thing you look at when you look at the city of Peterborough and you say, you know what, we have our fair share of challenges, but we've got this going for us right now. And you know what? I, I'm happy that we have that going for us. Hmm. We never talk about the good things, eh? <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, I'm going to um, Peterborough. And um, Peterborough has had and continues to have a willingness and an ability to come together as a community to support each other. And I have seen um, major flood events, 2004, 2005. I've seen incidents of fire. I've seen other matters in our community, even our own United Way, for example which still has one of the highest per capita givings for all communities in Canada, notwithstanding the various challenges that we have. So community, one of the things that, that I'm very proud of is that our community cares about itself. We care about our residents. It's not always perfect. There may be moments where somebody might question if that's 
being done, absolutely. But we generally care about each other and are generally considerate of each other. So we're a community that responds to our needs, right? So that's something I've been very proud of. And I've noted when I first, that's one of the things that I knew when I actually visited the city in 1986 on a provincial sports conference. And it's you could, you could sense something about the city. There's a sense of place. It values things. It values its downtown. It values Little Lake. It values things. And they're here. They still exist. Oh, I have so many memories on Little Lake that I am tearing up right now. <laughs> 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 There's no crying uh, in baseball. Sorry. No <laughs> crying in baseball. Uh, let's talk about my favorite subject. And I think it's a subject that a lot of people like to talk about as well, since I started talking about it on the show. I want to talk about tourism. Now, Peterborough has a very special place in my heart. I grew up in the area. I worked there for some for a few days a few weeks uh, that I went off to Lindsay but I still remember Little Lake I still remember taking a houseboat trip up this Trent Severn waterways I, my brother went to uh, Trent University I have so many memories of that community but from a counselor's perspective from a per person who represents your community I want to know the hidden gems what are the hidden gems in your community that you go, if you come to Peterborough, get off the beaten path and go see some of these great facilities, great amenities, great museums, great parks. What are those hidden gems for you when it comes to Peterborough? Well, the first one I'm going to say to isn't hidden, but it, I, I absolutely have to say the Canadian Canoe Museum is phenomenal. I have had um, I had occasion to attend its um, grand opening. Um, I've had the, the it is a I I don't think our community yet has begun to appreciate the impact it will have a sustained impact upon our community. So that's number one. Number two, it's the lake upon which it sits, the little lake. And our city is uh, soon, soon to be finishing the autonomy trail. So they, uh, we will have a trail that will loop all the way around the Little Lake. Now imagine, see, imagine that possibility. Park your car somewhere, lots of places, lots of parks, a ringer, Canadian can you, you can walk around the lake, enjoy restaurants. So that's a, that's an opportunity that is evolving. Uh, and in fact, some of that work started originally with Mayor Sylvia Sutherland when we created the first lake, Autonomy Trail. So kudos to Mayor Sutherland. Um, so some of our hidden gems. We have two active and vibrant markets. One, the traditional market that um, um, utilizes Morrill Park in its grounds, so near the Memorial Center. A longstanding tradition. It's, it's, it's really a quintessential farmer's market. And we have a second market that is held on Wednesdays and Saturdays in the summer downtown at Quaker Square. Quaker Square is a new municipal facility from upon which in the winter, we have an outdoor skating rink. Number three, food. We have, in my estimation, one, uh, probably some of the best uh, restaurants, uh, either traditional cuisine and or um, I would call it sort of you know, ethnic cuisine. Uh, we, we we rival any center and community, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the Hunter Street um, uh, area, for example, is stacked with various restaurants. George Street, various restaurants. So the culinary scene in downtown Peterborough is something to experience. Um, I would also say that another gem, well, is our Riverview Park and Zoo. It is a free public zoo. It's one of a kind. Now, by, I should also acknowledge, Chris, that the city um, is um, um, taking on the water division of Kofi. So uh, the city will be coordinating not only sewers, but will now soon be coordinating directly water. Within That will also give us direct responsibility over the Riverview Park and Zoo. So the Riverview Park and Zoo is very popular, but it's a gem. It's an absolute gem. It's worth the car ride to visit it. Um, all of our various trails, typical, like you, the, we, you can leave Peterborough and you're on, you are, it, the Trans Canada Trail travels directly through our city and it connects to a number of other centers. Uh, so in itself, that's just, those are easy, those are easy to find live examples. Um, now I also, Music Fest, 
So our, <laughs> our Summer Music Fest, which is Canada's largest free series of outdoor concerts. Uh, once again, Music Fest has launched a, a, a very impressive uh, lineup. So on a Wednesday night or a Saturday night at Del Curry Park downtown, there could be five, 10,000 persons attending a free concert. Free is concert. that gazebo still there? Is the big giant stadium uh, still there? That, or that sound gone? stage, that's, yeah, no, that sound stage um, has been removed because it was no wow. longer structurally. Sound. And we're in the midst of introducing a new uh, a stage for, for, that should be finished uh, for next next year, but it's well underway. I just remember that. the only reason I remember that is because it's the park is right across the the road from uh, 105 Country. Well, then it was 105 Country. It could yes, be exactly. Different. So, so I remember looking outside the studio window and seeing that every day. So, it was a great experience, and I remember catching many great shows there. Um, I can't believe we've gone this long without mentioning the one thing that Peterborough is well known for, and that's the Peterborough Peets. The good old hockey yes, team, do. like they are like, uh, for me, like I grew up with the Oshawa Generals and the Peterborough Peets, sort of the rivalry that was them. Um, are they still around? The Peterborough Peets, uh, yes, they still exist. They're a storied hockey franchise. Uh, two years ago, two seasons ago, they made a most impressive run all the way to the finals in the Memorial Cup. Um, they were they were not successful in capturing the uh, Memorial Cup, uh, and last season would have been described as similar to my beloved Montreal Canadiens, a rebuilding season. But it's still a very popular sport franchise, still utilizing our the Memorial Center. Now our city, like other uh, communities in uh, Canada, I believe Charleston PEI is a, um, a more recent example, are contemplating a new event and sports facility. Uh, and the uh, most recent staff report is uh, uh, and recommendation from the consultant group is a particular location in the downtown or the central area part of our community. The emphasis is event and sports. And what would occur is that assuming this takes hold, may take time to develop that, the Peterborough Peets would eventually be playing and that would be their new home, as it would be for the uh, Peterborough Lakers, our senior lacrosse team. So we have two... Uh, we have two, we have a lacrosse club, which is uh, currently using a Memorial Center and in the Peterborough Peets. That's still a community arena, the Memorial Center, but those two sport franchises have long, long storied history in our community. They certainly do. Um, I feel like I've already asked this question, but I want to just make sure I got it correct here. Um, I need you to play a little bit of Sophie's Choice with me, if you don't mind, for a second. I know that reference doesn't go to go by a lot, but where's the place in the community that you can go to decompress? After a long day of work, after a long day of council meetings, is there a place in the community you can go and just recenter yourself, knowing that tomorrow morning you're going to have to get back up and do it all over again and try to leave Peterborough a little bit better than you left it the day before? Well, they're um, my backyard. Have our, our we uh, we we have a house in the mid part of our city. Uh, it's a, you know older home where the heat goes out and the cold comes in. Uh, but we have a we're we're fortunate. We have a long narrow lot, and the backyard is quiet. It's peaceful. Um, uh, the other place that I would go to is family. Uh, my wife and or and our time with our grandkids, our cottage or what even it's here. Um, I also find, um, you know, uh, it's not a quiet where I, I I on my spin bike. You know, I work out. That's that's private time. <laughs> or even any you know, private time is better time, right? Yeah, but it's it's very easy to. There are many places we have favorite restaurants we'll go to. It might be out, you know, go out to a restaurant bite to eat and a pint or something to that effect. Peterborough offers all that to us, uh, but I would say the one place where it's just in my backyard, just chill, read a book, relax. Okay, if you're reading a book, I've got to ask the not municipal question because I'm a book reader as well. What's the last book you read? Um, I'll show you. There you go. For those who are watching, you're about to see it. And for those who are listening, hopefully he'll say the title of the book, Enslaved by... Enslaved. It, ha 
It has to deal with the transatlantic uh, slave trade and the, the myriad of shipwrecks and consequences of shipwrecks and what they were finding uh, from the transatlantic slave trade. And some of it even includes some of the Great Lakes. Um, it's uh, Samuel Jackson was uh, behind. He also sponsored some of it. It's a, a diving group. It's um, there are moments reading this book that I actually you put the book away. It's so frustrating. But it's it, it's a painful reminder of um, um, <laughs> circumstances that have it, it just the greed of some countries and some people. It's a good book. I'll, I'll have to pick it up. Um, so we're about 45 minutes into this and I want to ask the final question. It's the million dollar question, in my opinion. You've alluded to it a little bit in some of your questions, but let's uh, bring it all together and ask the simple question, but it's the over the million dollar one. In your opinion, what makes Peterborough such a unique place to live, to work and to raise a family? Good, very, very good question. Number one, geography. We're an hour and a half from Toronto. We're three hours from Ottawa. We're not, we're not necessarily being crowded by another adjacent municipality. Not that that's a bad thing, but we we have a unique geography. It's number one. Number two, um, I spoke earlier. Um, it, it it is a community that. It is self-sufficient. It is self-reliant. It's a bit stubborn, but it has a it has certain values that have served our community very well over time. They have protected and conserved their downtown. We have a very impressive downtown with a rich inventory of buildings that a community could have just said we don't care anymore, but they chose to care. Right now, um, so geography, sort of community values. Um, and and it's the scale of community. We're still even. I think I think the city uh, currently rests about eighty five thousand persons. If it reached its target one hundred and twenty thousand, I don't. I maintain we won't be taking away from the intimacy of scale that we realize in our community. I think we can still achieve um, and maintain that sort of value and, and uh, uh, sense of community uh, as we you know, our, our population increases. So those three, those three factors. Kevin, counselor, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for sitting down and taking time out of your busy schedule to do this. It's always a pleasure to sit down with municipal leaders, but it's always a pleasure to sit down with municipal leaders who represent the old community that I used to live in. So I truly <laughs> appreciate you taking time and sitting down with me, talking about yourself, talking about the city of Peterborough. And I'm looking forward to coming back later on this summer. And hopefully when I'm there, we can go, uh, A, rather walk around the little lake or B, go to the Canoe Museum and go see it firsthand. Because I don't think I remember, if probably way, or probably launched or opened after I left. So I'm looking forward to seeing it firsthand. So thank you so much. Chris, it was my uh, pleasure. And uh, thank you for... Um taking an interest in municipal politics and allowing myself and our colleagues, my colleagues to, you know, maybe sh to share some, shed some light about, you know, what makes us tick, why we're running for, what matters to us. So thank you for, for this opportunity. It was my pleasure to chat with you today. Thanks so much for tuning in for another great episode of the Cross Border Interviews. If you haven't already, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our great conversations that we have coming up. And when we return for season seven of the Cross Border Interviews in September later this year. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, but as always, just keep talking, guys.